Believe in prayer, God changes things, doesn't he, when God's people do something. We're going to do a little bit of time of prayer at the end, and uh, we're going to have uh, Reverend Terry uh, come and pray at the end as well, and some other things that are going to happen after I share. But I'm, I'm really excited to share with you today. I'm always excited because I feel like God gives me things in my heart uh, to share with you, and I rely on that. Um, I totally rely on that. And so it was really neat when the music, certain songs go with what I'm going to be talking about. And then I'm just like so encouraged. It just oh, rejuvenates me even more. What does putting God first look like in your life? I'm going to be looking at the first four commandments today uh, of the Ten Commandments. And you can find the Ten Commandments in two places. Exodus, that's where Moses was when he brought the people out um, and he gave them the Ten Commandments. You can also find it in Deuteronomy. So if you ever want to know and somebody says, where is that found? Exodus, they were exiting out of Egypt. And then Deuteronomy is that book of do's. Okay, so you kind of think of it as do, Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy 5. The Jewish people had 613 commands given to them to abide by. That sounds like a whole lot, but in the scheme of things, we live by a lot of rules today in the USA. We have so many rules to abide by. And so when we look at these, you think 613 sounds like a whole lot. Now there's three different types of laws that they had and commands. There were civil laws that instructed them for daily living. We could identify with some of that. We have laws in our land of stop signs and go signs and yield signs. And there's rules in we're buying this or we're selling my mother's property out there. And there's all these rules that you have to abide by in that regard. There's, they're just in order to function as a society, there's laws. And so then there's also the ceremonial laws. And in the Old Testament, the Jews would look to that to find out what was going to be happening in the temple of God. He had certain mandates of how he expected them to worship God and the works that were to happen in the temple. And all being a foreshadow of this Jesus who would be the final sacrifice for sin it was a beautiful thing. And so, and then you third, the third part is the moral laws. And the summary of those moral laws are compiled into the Ten Commandments. And it was to help the people understand that you are a moral being because you have choices that you are making of following after a holy God or not, which would be the opposite of a sinful, evil enemy, Satan himself. So which will it be? And so when, when we look at these Ten Commandments, I'm going to kind of touch on a few of them. But the first four commandments are really important because it all focuses in on our um, command and love for God. And then the final six are all about how we relate and our commands of how we relate to people. So the first part is all on God. Now in 1980, the U.S. Supreme Court decided that no longer should we have the Ten Commandments placed up in the school. It happened in Kentucky. And so there was this mandate of the school system that in every public school, they would have these Ten Commandments posted up. And somebody rose up, separation of state and church, and said, no way. It wasn't so much of the relationship of the last six that they objected to. It was the first four. But we know that the first four, our relationship with God, is going to help us live out the last six can't do it without him. And what has happened in the school system since then, it's only been 45 years ago. Some of you are not quite that old. But what has happened since then is there's been shootings in school, there's been lying, there's been cheating, because 
Some people say, well, everybody do what you want to do. Well, we know a society cannot function without a moral compass guiding us as to what our life should look like. So this moral compass has to identify to you and to me who is our God that's going to guide us in this moral path. We know in Christianity and the Jewish belief system that it is the one true God. It's the commandments of God to us. And to me, this is a beautiful message because there are other little gods that are trying to vie for our attention to say, put me number one. Put me number one. Oh, come on, put me number one. Your job, your finances, people, circumstances, pleasing people, all of these are vying for your attention. And so when we choose as God's people to put God first as the first commandment we're going to look at, he begins to transform us. He begins to change us on the inside. And we're going to look at how we can do that and what that actually looks like and should look like in our lives. So Exodus, we're going to look at that scripture to look at the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, verse 1. Then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord your God. I am the one who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. Now you can use this in a spiritual sense too because God, the eternal one God, is the one that wants to free us from the slavery that sin has on our lives. So you see the picture, he's taking them out of the Egypt because they're under bondage over Pharaoh, and he's saying, I'm going to take you as my people, and I'm going to bring you out to the promised land, the promises of God. Is this beautiful? All the promises that he wanted to fulfill in their lives. I'm going to take you out of your sin and your despair and your dysfunction on all this that is binding you up, all of your thinking, all of your behavior, and I'm going to take you out and I'm going to free you so you can be free from it. That's the good news. Isn't that good news? So then he goes on and says, you must not have any other little g God but me. None. He is God. So if I wanted to sum it up in one little statement, thou shalt have no other gods before me. None. All the others will fall in line when we know our priority and what is number one in our lives. Everything else falls into alignment. Okay, now let's look at the second part, second one. You must not make for yourselves an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens and the earth or in the sea. Don't create something and put all your trust and hope in that. Some of, a, some of us think, well, that's the idols that other countries have. But sometimes we put our hope in the stock market. Ha, ha. Sometimes we put our hope in, in, in what the boss has said to us and that I'm going to get that raise and I'm going to get that promotion. Ha, ha. Disappointments come when we put it in anything but God. And I loved how the songs we sang a little bit earlier because sometimes those seasons in our lives look like God's not with us, God doesn't care. But no matter what, I will bless you and I will praise you in every season of my life. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. We know in the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were called upon to bow to an idol and they were thrown in a fiery furnace and they said, no matter what you do, I will not bow. Now we've not been asked to do that necessarily. We have a free will here in our country. 
but we cannot let others determine our allegiance to God. So whatever he speaks to our heart, whatever he says in our lives, this we ought to obey and not bow down to anyone else's thinking or asking. Then look at verse 5. It says, I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. What do you mean? You, I sinned. Why, why would you put that on my children? Because you role modeled to them. Because your behavior role modeled to your children that this is acceptable or this is not acceptable. And so when you do that, when I do that, and I say that it's acceptable and it's not acceptable by God, I'm passing on that same behavior, that same sin on to the next generation. Humbles us, doesn't it? Holds us to a high standard of responsibility. Put God first in your life. Because when we don't, it affects the next generation. Exactly what that song was saying. You want to be blessed, right? So let's read on. Let's read on. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my command. I lavish it on them. I lavish. We begin to experience what God's love really is when we obey him. When we obey him and what he asks. So second command really summed up, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. No other gods before me. Don't put anything up there that's more important than me. And, and there are times when I have to ask God, I have to say, God, what do you think? Because this is what my mind's telling me. And this is discouraging me. Or this is what somebody is saying to me. And they're giving me advice on this. God, what are you saying to me? I want to hear what you have to say. And then I need to respond. And I can respond when I hear him and my heart's submissive towards him and I'm humbling before him because then when he speaks, I have the courage to do what's right. I don't have it before that. Okay, so let's read on. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. In other words, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. No swearing, flippantly using his name. So I'm, I'm telling you, it grieves my heart when I hear it and, and I see it in people's communication out in places of grocery shopping and, and different things or on TV or on the radio and they just say God's name. Like, you know, you know I, I wish they would rather say, oh, rats or something like that. But no, they use God, the God of the universe, their creator God in a flippant way. Don't think you're not going to suffer for that. And training our children in such a way that says a reverence and a fear for God, because that's who we will see when we pass on from this life. It's him. We come before him. This is the part. This, look at this. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Sabbath for the Jews was Friday evening to Saturday evening, and most Christians observe it on Sunday, and some have other responsibilities and will do it on other days. I find it interesting because the first three verses are all about God, and then all of a sudden he, he starts honing in to who we are because before we pass on to the next six verses about loving other people, he must stop and say, I want you to remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Take time out to reevaluate once every seven days on the seventh day. 
because you sometimes can kind of get a little bit off course or something. But on that Sabbath day, you come and you worship him and you refocus and you get rejuvenated and you start saying, oh God, you were speaking to me over here and I kind of put that by at bay and, and I need to be reminded in Leviticus 25, it talks about the seventh year that even the land was to rest. Do nothing on the land. Don't pluck it. Don't pull anything from the vine. Don't, don't uh, trim it. Don't do any work on that seventh year. He does not just stop with giving one verse for this. This is how important this is because I truly believe that we need a Sabbath every day with God. You want to be strong in your faith with the Lord Jesus Christ? Spend a little bit of time with Jesus every day. There's this Sabbath that, that you come and you come into his presence and, and Daniel did it three times a day, morning, noon, and night. And that's what it looked like for him. And he knew his responsibility required it. And he knew he needed to hear from God and have the strength to endure in a community that was not his own. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. And that's what you're doing here today. This is a part of what that Sabbath would look like. What does it look like? For us, when we were raising our children and Rob was working night and day and everything, and there were five days in that week, and all of a sudden they said, uh, we want you to have your business open for retail on Saturday. And, and we, we talked about it. Didn't take much talking, didn't take much time. And Rob said, I am not opening another day of the week. I'm just not going to do it. My family comes first on that Saturday, and I'm going to spend time in church on Sunday. Because the decisions that we make affect the next generation. And we have to listen to what God is trying to say. And he is saying, the seventh day, you and I need a day when we rest. And I'm telling you, yesterday, that's pretty much what I did. I sat around the whole day, did a little bit here and there, and I just sat. I don't know how many steps I got. I never even, I didn't even have time to look. Because the beautiful thing was, through the last few weeks of having the Ukrainians here on the property, it was very taxing. The last seven left on Friday, and then Joan and some others and a few of them began to work and to clean up and get it all ready for Sunday, and I just said, thank you, Jesus. If you don't think you need rest, it will eventually affect you physically. And you don't have to have a reason. I used to feel so bad. I don't know why. I just thought I should be doing all the time. But I was reminded in a devotional that was given in our group, and it said, we are human, not human doings. We are human beings. And so we come in our being before God and say, Jesus I need to be rejuvenated. Now, what's the problem here is that some people say, well, I just need a little more me time. And then they go out and they go shopping or they're going in this and then they go and getting away. And I think I just need a little me time. And God says, no, you need a little bit of me time up here with God. That's what's needed. Time with the Lord. Not more selfishness, not more of this. And I'm not saying that we don't go and take care of ourselves. Don't take that. But we need time with the Lord. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. It's not like you just sit over there and say, well, I'm taking a Sabbath, now go get me that iced tea and bring it to me right here. And you're going to make the dinner tonight. And every, come on, children, go clean your rooms. And, you know, let's, no. Everybody in the whole household 
And so we can go and play games as a family and we can go and family becomes a priority and, and we can just do whatever we feel like we want to do. And back in the day, it could be some fun things and maybe you got with a friends and you just sat around and you just enjoyed watching your kids play together and you just, you're just saying, this is the day that we don't have to, ju I mean, tell a five-year-old that they're just going to sit for five, ten hours. That's not going to happen. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to spend time in fellowship and in love with the family of God and with your family and figure out what that looks like and enjoy the day. And you have permission, no laundry. You have permission. You don't have to go clean the car. You have permission. Just enjoy. Enjoy the day. This is my day that I set aside. And world, you're not going to understand it. But God deems it so important that he puts it segue of this is, you're going to try to be like me, God. I rested. I rested. Look here, it says, this includes you, your sons, your daughters, your male, female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything in them. And then he says, but on the seventh day he, God, rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. We are doing what he would do. And he says, I think this is so important that I'm going to tell you. And it'll revolutionize your energy. It'll encourage your family to say, oh, we're a priority, today. we're just having fun today. What does that look like? We're resting. Oh, when I grew up, we all took a nap. I know my parents, they just loved it. Five kids, you know, just everybody's taking a nap. <laughs> Sunday nap, everybody goes to their room, take a nap. And then when we get up, we can play, and we'd have all these fun things that we would do. In other words, number four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Because if you don't get rejuvenated, you're not going to be able to do for anybody else. Sabbath is rest. The most important one, there was this in Mark 12, uh, one of the teachers of the law came and heard him debating with others, and he's answering questions, and, and they said, one of them asked, what is the most important commandment? And he said, the most important one, Jesus said, is this, hear, O Israel, I want to remind you that the Lord, the God, is one. He is one God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love God with everything you got, is what he's saying. And the second is this, because this is the second part of the Ten Commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. What they're trying to say is love God, love people. Love God, love people. I'm going to just go through the last of the Ten Commandments just so you can get a picture that when we love people, it is an expression of loving God. Honor your father and your mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet. Don't wish for other people's things. Be happy with what you've got. So what does, what does it look like putting God first in your life? What does it look like? It's living out what God has asked of us to do. Love God. Love people. But I'm going to really focus in on this. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. When you find yourself weak, you might be in a place where God is going to use you and stretch you, and he's going to say, now I need time with you every single day. Give me a portion of your time every day. Spend time with me. Let me love on you. Let me strengthen you. And just receive and worship him. Have Terry, uh, Reverend Terry, come up, and he's going to be sharing a couple things. And uh, I truly believe that this sabbatical that I'm going on in the next eight weeks is one because God is preparing the church for something that is new. And the board came up with wanting somebody to share and pray over Rob and me. I believe we're a duo here. And... Um, 
God is calling me away to prepare me for what, this is what I truly believe, what God has for the church. And I need to be able to hear from God because God has taken us on this journey of watching him do what he wants to do. And I can have one person over here say, I think that we need to do this next. Godly person. Another person over here, I think we need to do this next. Godly person. I think we, this is what needs to be focused on. Godly person. And so it's not just a time for me to hear from God but it's a time for the church to hear and be prepared for what God is going to do in this next season of my life here. So I need to stop talking, Terry, because you right. have something to share. Okay, and uh, let's see, Brother Rob, if you would come as well, that would uh, sort of complete the picture here. This is what the board asked, huh? <laughs> yes. That's good. Well, I just happen to have a little note here. Pastor Becky and Rob will be on a sabbatical for two months, May and June, leaving early this week, traveling, visiting family, friends, and faraway places. In the Church of the Nazarene, following at least seven full years in a local church, the local church board with approval by the district superintendent may grant a sabbatical for their pastor. As the Sabbath was meant to be a day of rest following a full day of work, and we've just heard about that, haven't we? Just so a sabbatical is designed to be a release from the routine of the pastoral assignment for the physical, emotional, spiritual, intellectual well-being of the pastor and spouse. The church board, working with the district superintendent, has selected Pastor Paul Straub to be our interim pastor during the next two months. This sabbatical has been delayed by over a year by the onset of the COVID epidemic. Pastor Becky and Rob have stayed with us in the midst of the worst epidemic to strike the entire world since the Spanish flu in 1918, over 100 years ago. The papes, papes stuck with us in this crucial period. Indoor church services canceled, Zoom services organized, two separate congregations formed, <laughs> indoor, uh, outdoor services arranged when that became possible. The challenges have been enormous. If ever a pastoral couple were ready for a sabbatical, ours certainly qualifies. The spiritual, emotional, physical, and mental challenges for the past two years have whipsawed emotions in every one of us in an unprecedented way. A strong, steady hand on the tiller has seen us through the storms. A period of serenity has overtaken our souls, grateful to enter calmer waters. And all this while, Pastor Becky has lost two key members of her pastoral team, needing to be replaced. Also, there was the stress of loss of family members, children's weddings to attend, memorials here in our local church, but also victories through the entire storm period. Conversions, remember conversions? Oh yes, baptisms, dedications, church dinners, even zone rallies here at our local church. So I say a unified, heartfelt thank you to Pastor Becky and Rob for carefully prepared, biblically, for carefully prepared, biblically-based sermons, dedicated care for the congregation in the past two years, particularly, but also working on district committees and boards, which consumed a great deal of time. And often when there were some of her own health issues to contend with, it's been a concern over these years. And then, just as they were preparing for the sabbatical, now we have the Ukrainian crisis. And as it turns out, our church was selected to be one of those hubs to receive Ukrainians, to send them on their way to relatives or friends in other parts of the U.S. And apparently there were, I believe there were a total of 33 who found their way here over a period of time. And Pastor Becky and Rob just dug in and night and day, worked harder than anybody else with maybe a possible exception of uh, BJ and Maddie. While we have spoken of Pastor Becky's awesome service among us, let us remember Rob. His incredible, unfailing, intrepid service, keeping our grounds <clears throat> in order, beautified, newly furnished classrooms, painting, installation of new plumbing, repairs to an old complex, went on and on. 
Only co-workers like Don Crittenden, Boyd Moore, and lately Ivan and Kevin know of the extent of the church profiting from Rob's experience in the construction and repair industry. Well, I think it's only fitting that we pray over them. And I invite any of you who want to be a part in that to come forward right now. Uh, and we'll close with prayer for Pastor uh, Becky and Rob. We'll place our hands on them and pray. And if you wish, you may come forward at this time. We thank you, Pastor Becky and Rob. We have labored together in service, seen your hearts, your love, your caring, holiness of heart and life, and we are all grateful. We will pray now. As we send Pastor and Rob on their way to a well-deserved sabbatical, sending them on their way with our blessing, appreciation, and under the daily leadership of the Holy Spirit until they return to us following their two-month leave. I've asked Joan if she would to pray for us as we send Pastor Becky and Rob on their way. Father, thank you for your leadership. Holy, holy, holy. Your ways are perfect. You know what we need individually and as a family, a church family. Thank you for providing <laughs> through these years. You, you know, and you know the future. And we thank you for this time that has been ordained by you. You have a plan for this time, Lord, for Rob, for Pastor Becky. And just like uh, Stan Reeder, our regional USA Canada director, urged us to pray for protection, direction, revelation, we pray that for Rob and Beck that you will protect them on their way, go before them through, through the, the travel, through their time with family, protect their bodies, their minds, their spirits, Lord. We pray for direction for them and as they counsel their family members and those along the way, even in restaurants, wherever they stop, your direction, Lord, for them that, that um, they will just have your words, your thoughts to, to convey. They will be an amazing blessing to their families and for your revelation, Lord. That's most important, and that you will reveal your mind, your heart, your purpose to them as a couple, as a family. Individually, the relationship with you, fill them anew with your Holy Spirit, your anointing on their individual ministries. We don't just pray that for Pastor Becky and the spoken word and her ministry as a shepherd, but on Rob, his position, what you've called him to, Lord, an anointing. We think of the way you did that through the Bible. You anointed those with gifting. They were holy, no more important than the spoken word. Anoint Rob anew, and re renew him, re-energize him, Lord. He needs a touch. We pray that, God. Reveal your purpose for that, that you will reveal to them for uh, what you want to do here in Escondido in Southern California, Lord. You have a purpose. You revealed some of that through the Ukrainian ministry, Lord. It was amazing how Pastor Becky just opened her office, opened the shower, you know, just come on in to my private place. It, it, that wasn't comfortable, but you helped her do that, Lord. And so as you prepare the way, you will make her comfortable. You make Rob, you'll make us all comfortable with what you want to do. Maybe it's not our comfort place, but God, just mold us together, unite our hearts. As you speak to Rob and Becky on their trip, speak to us, Lord, here, that we would be one. We would be one as we pray our way to Pentecost, Lord, do a mighty thing that only you can do, Lord. Pour out your spirit and have your way. We submit our way to you. And we thank you, Lord, that you will, you'll bring them back to us and we'll be amazed at what you have said in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus. Amen. Now, just a word from the scriptures of benediction from 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, 3. We'll be thinking of you every day, praying for you every day as you go. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Well, the Lord bless you. You are dismissed. God is with you. And uh, you are in my prayers even when I'm gone.